Hi, welcome everyone to today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. I'm Eric from the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, and we host this event every week. Uh, so make sure you uh, join us in future Tuesdays if it's something you enjoy. I'm going to introduce our moderator for today. Dr. Sean Evans was born and educated in the United Kingdom. While studying zoology at the University of London, she had the good fortune uh, to be introduced to Porky the alpha male in a group of pigtails monkey, pigtail monkeys living in the London Zoo. This meeting and her subsequent study of social dynamics of Porky's group proved pivotal in shaping her future career. And Dr. Evans was just sharing her personal advice with me that I'd like to share with you. When you find your Porky, uh, make sure that you uh, go along with that. And if you have this event in your life that looks like it could change where you're going, don't take that for granted. So always look out for when you find your Porky. Uh, Dr. Evans reconsidered her interest in pursuing a career in medical research. And uh, while evaluating her future, received a master's degree in bio biological anthropology from the University of Durham. Uh, she traded in her peachy dishes and pipettes for primates and studied marmosets and their apparently monogamous lifestyle. As a result, she was awarded her PhD in 1981 from the University of Wales. She has lived and studied primates in Africa, where she has the fortunate enough experience to watch mandrills from her kitchen window and also help raise orphan gorillas. Um, her visit with Coco and Gorilla with an impressive American Sign Language vocabulary in California rivaled her initial meeting with Porky 15 years earlier and motivated her to investigate how great apes view and remember the world. She has published on the abilities of apes to uh, recognize themselves and mirror the memories for future events. Currently, she teaches here at Florida International University's uh, Biological Sciences Department. And uh, as you can see from her vast experience and passion for the field, we're very lucky to have her here at FIU. Um, with her collaboration and encouragement, uh, students and scientists have worked together to discover that owl monkeys uh, anoint with millipedes that they have a neat pattern of food sharing and that family members share a characteristic smelly signature. And she has used her primate washing techniques to study human behavior, which is very relevant to our current topic today of the evolution and the importance of the biological state of cooperation. So I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. Sean Evans. Thank you, Eric. Eric and I are going to be very cooperative today. He's going to sit here and make sure that my video clips play. And if, oh, we've got it up on the screen. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction. And first off, I want to say I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm a primatologist. But I'm a primatologist that's really interesting and interested in figuring out what goes on inside the minds of great apes. Um, I've been fascinated with this ever since I met Coco, a very impressive sign language gorilla. Um, when I met her, she asked me a couple of questions, and she used sign language to ask those questions. And it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life when I met a gorilla that could use a human language and I didn't understand. She had two questions for me. One, was I wearing lipstick? And I wasn't, but I sent her a bunch of lipstick afterwards because I hear that she likes putting it on. And the other was, could I pick her a bunch of flowers? And I could do that. And she seemed very pleased with the selection I gave her. Um, but about, about seven years ago, I had the good fortune to team up with anthropologists at the University of Miami, um, one of which is now here at FIU, Dr. David Brown in the School of Medicine. And I've been, a ha been able to do ethnographic studies, go into neighborhoods in Miami um, and see um, how people interact locally. The kind of topics we investigated were uh, teenage smoking. Uh, I also investigated marriages in um, South Florida. Uh, and the latest one was access to healthcare in Overtown. Um, I really enjoy doing ethnography. It's kind of participant observation. Um, my greatest success was when I was trying to interview a woman that um, worked in a laundromat. And I was very um, sensitive to the issue that I didn't want to seem to be imposing on her time. So I took a comforter with me and asked if she would wash it for me, for which I paid her, and I chatted to her while she was doing that. And as I left the laundromat, I ran into some of our anthropology team that were talking to two people that were previously homeless. And when they saw me, 
emerge in my typically disheveled way, clutching, clutching a comforter. They said to me, don't worry, don't give up. <laughs> Things will improve for you. So I realized I had been mistaken for a homeless person. So I thought that that actually um, underscored the effectiveness um, that I had as, a, um, as an ethnographer. So today, I want to look at the topic of cooperation. Um, and I want to introduce you to first the, um, oh, well, actually, Eric, you can do this for me, to the great apes. The great apes are our closest living relatives. There are four species of great apes. Well, we four types of great apes. Chimpanzees and bonobos, which are the next one. Okay, both chimpanzees and bonobos are very closely related, and they live in Africa. The third great ape, I believe, is, yes, gorillas. Gorillas are also African apes. And the fourth great ape lives on the continent, uh, on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra in Indonesia. All great apes are extremely endangered, and we do unspeakable things to their habitat. And, unfortunately, in Africa in particular, we consume them for bushmeat. So it's extremely challenging um, to think of ways in which we can um, preserve these wonderful creatures. But what I want to think about today, with the help of one article from the New York Times and two book reviews of the same book, um, is explore, are humans unique? And if they are, what makes us unique? Um, we do share the majority of our cognitive skills with great apes. Of that, there is no doubt. But there, people have frequently thought that humans are unique. First of all, man was described as man the tool maker. And then Jane Goodall in Africa at Gombe Stream Reserve um, discovered that chimpanzees use tools. We now know that chimpanzees in many areas, most areas of Africa, use tools and have a very well-developed toolkit. Um, humans use language. Hey, I met Coco. She knew what to do. She knew what to ask me. Language-trained apes have made us revise whether humans alone have language. Um, and there have been other attempts as well. But most recently, it, a lot of studies, comparative studies, looking at similarities between great apes and humans, have suggested that we possess a unique skill for living collaboratively. Um, we learn socially, we exchange information in cultural groups. And it's our unique ability to cooperate. We cooperate in a different way than any other animal that allows us to do this. Um, and I think what's next. So what makes humans unique? And here's a summary. Our unique suite for living collaboratively, learning socially, and exchanging information in cultural groups. And it is this unique ability, ability to cooperate that makes this possible. But there are lots of cooperative animals. I'm talking now about the evolution of human cooperation, so I'm going to restrict um, this topic of um, animal cooperation to great apes. And I think the next slide, Eric, is the... Oh, okay, and i deal with this before we looked at the video clips. So how could cooperation evolve? Cooperation can evolve either through kin selection and that is, we help our relatives, and we help our relatives we, because we share genes in common. Another way is reciprocity. I'll help you out if you help me. So you will help, um, or an animal will help another um, in the, with the expectation of help in return in the future. And the third, which is very controversial, but is mentioned in the, re, in the reviews to the books is group selection. And it seems to be particularly important to um, human cooperation in social groups in which people behave altruistically, and I mean help others, um, they have some advantage over groups that do not. And so that's natural selection, not acting on the individual, <laughs> as it does in kin selection or reciprocity, but acting on the group. And the behaviors that promote cooperation are, told, are, called, are termed prosocial or helping behaviors. 
and I think the next one is, yeah, so we're going to look at a couple of video clips. The first video clip is of chimpanzees cooperating to hunt in an African forest. Get it to go full screen. Okay. Well known as social, intelligent animals that are mainly vegetarian. But they have a darker side. They're also aggressive carnivores that hunt as a pack using devious and deadly tactics. Their prey? Red colorless monkeys. Male chimps team up into hunting parties of other bird individuals. They set yeah. up on patrols it's a very forest. short clip. I think people can see They walk it. quietly, listening for the colorless monkeys who stick to the tops of the tallest trees. Once the chimps find their prey, their game plan kicks in. The team splits up to take their positions. The driver moves first, climbing upward to flush the colobus out of their tree. Two bloggers stay below and watch which way the colobus move. It's the blocker's job to run ahead and climb up on either side of the colonist group and follow them in a particular direction. But it's the ambusher who has the critical role. He stays on the ground longest to try and get ahead of everyone. Then he picks a good tree, climbs, and waits. The trap is set. Unaware of what lies ahead, the colorless monkeys are forced into the ambush. Suddenly, a gap appears in the canopy and a colorless leaps right into the ambusher's tree. When it sees the danger, turns and leaps back. Only to be snatched by another chimp in the team. It's game over. Chimps win, call us lose. On the ground, chimps from the rest of the troop, who follow behind, shriek and yell with anticipation. The meat will be shared among them. The hunting band of brothers may be brutal, but their teamwork provides nutritious food for all the family. So you see, that's a pretty impressive demonstration of teamwork by a group of chimpanzees. They really did seem to operate together as a team and cooperate, um, in this case, unfortunately, to catch a poor colobus monkey. But chimpanzees are not really the most um, collaborative of all the great apes. Um, they are, in fact, pretty competitive, aggressive guys, especially the males. Hierarchy in the rainforest, in the case of chimpanzees, is very pronounced. Uh -huh. Can I just ask a question? Once mm -hmm. they actually kill the prey, yes. and then they're going to eat it in the group, Yes. is the food distributed evenly amongst the community, and then do also the animals that aren't involved in the hunting get some? No and yes. Okay, it's not equally distributed within the group. The, the males that hunt um, share in the major spoils. The other group members will sit around and beg for food. And some of them may be rewarded. If females are rewarded, it's typical for the males to expect sex in return. 
so that so I'm just wondering because it seems to me that Okay, so there's cooperation by those who are involved directly in that. Yeah, it's the then, cooperation in the hunt. They're not terribly cooperative when it comes to food sharing. Distributing, yeah. Distributing it, yes. And then what? And then you know what bearing does that have on the whole cooperative enterprise? I'm just. But it shows that they can work together as a team. That's mm -hmm. cooperation. But they are not the most cooperative great ape. The most cooperative great ape is the bonobo, and we're going to watch a short video clip of bonobos doing a cooperative task in captivity that, a, that chimpanzees could not do. <coughs> Calmer than chimps, how do bonobos fare in the cooperation test? Food is placed in a central shared well. Okay, ready? One, two, three. All the food is in the same dish. So it's very easy for one individual to bump the other individual out of the way and steal it all. Okay, you Okay, one, two, three, go. It takes the bonobos a while to get on task. <laughs> but soon they get the hang of it. With their more congenial temperaments, bonobos are more cooperative than chimps are. In fact, bonobos may take cooperation even further. When a young male died at the center in Japan, workers tried to remove his body. The staff decided to use sticks and try to move the bonobo towards a door they mounted uh, an incredible defense of this body that surprised everybody and was extremely moving. That's a fascinating reaction on the part of the bonobos. They were not related to that individual, and yet they took extreme risks to protect his body. As they fend off the humans, it seems as if they are cooperating. But what does it take to work together? Are they comparing the number of staff to their own troops? Can they calculate at all? So chimpanzees cannot cooperate in a similar task. If they there are two chimpanzees pulling the food towards them in the way the bonobos did. They would not share the food in the central well. The dominant chimp would take it from the subordinate chimp. So bonobos are way more cooperative. And we think that has everything to do with resources. They live in um, an area of Africa south of the Congo where there are resources are far more plentiful than, they, than the, the, the areas in which chimpanzees live. So we think it has everything to do with resource competition. But bonobos do not come close to the kind of cooperation that humans show and that humans um, evolved um, as hunter-gatherers, nomadic hunter-gatherers um, long ago in our evolutionary history. And the final video clip I want to show is of the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, Tanzania that are hunter-gatherers, and it shows their cooperative nature and how well developed it is very clearly. traveling around remote regions of Lake Iasi in northern Tanzania, the Pahadza, for one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer populations on the planet. And my goal is to explore the origins of human social networks and the evolution of cooperation. The hunter-gatherer lifestyle predates agriculture, villages, and even domesticated animals. Isolated from modern cultural influences, the Hadza essentially live as our ancestors did tens of thousands of years ago, roaming rugged terrain and forming temporary camps along the way. Their lives offer us a window into our past, 
and clues about the evolution of cooperation. For the Hadza, cooperation is the key to survival. These welcoming, resilient people share almost everything, food, labor, child care, which <coughs> raises the question, are there some people who are just looking for a free ride in the community? The free riders would be expected to garner more resources than altruists. Eventually, their behavior would unravel the social fabric. Do the Hadza have a mechanism to keep this from occurring? Social network experts Nicholas Christakis here at Harvard Medical School and James Fowler from the University of California in San Diego helped me design a study to answer these and other questions. Specifically, we designed exercises to measure social ties and cooperation. <coughs> Over the course of several months, I visited 17 different Hadza camps, which was no easy feat. The terrain was a challenge, and it was often difficult to find the camps because the Hadza are nomadic. They move every four to six weeks. The Hadza don't own things, so they don't have to stay in one place. And camp membership is also fluid. If an individual is unhappy with a particular group, he or she can move to a different one. I was greeted warmly at each camp, where I found many adults, 205 in all, eager to take part in our study. I showed each participant photos of 517 adult Hadza that were collected during past research with the community. I asked, who would you like to live with after this camp ends? We also used games with honey, a favorite food of the Hadza, to shed light on ties in the community. For example, one game allowed us to measure the tendency of particular individuals to cooperate. Each participant decided how to distribute four sticks of honey after listening to the rules. When we mapped individual traits with social ties, the results were astounding. Cooperators cluster together. They become friends with other cooperators, which keeps self-interested individuals from dragging them down. And what's more, the architecture of the Hadza social network matches that of modern social networks. These findings provide crucial insight into the evolution of cooperation and altruism in humans and suggest that social networks have been a fundamental part of human life since ancient times. Okay, so that's the handset. We have very high levels of cooperative um, behavior. So what about our society? How do you view cooperation here at FIU? As students, um, there was the word freeloader used. If we look at David Brooks' article, he begins by talking about the competitive nature of humans, but then he becomes convinced about the importance of cooperation. But how do you guys feel in how you lead your daily lives? Any of you do group projects, do you find that it's typically a cooperative event or is there a couple of people that do all the work and several freeloaders? What's your experience of cooperation at a student level? Can you, can you give your name, please? you identify the person that takes charge? <laughs> so that's not, and when you say that they will get the most out of it, how do you, how would you um, characterize that? You're motivated. Your motivation to do well is the is the basis. Did anybody else have similar experiences? 
or in cooperation in other aspects of your lives. where there is less, I mean, the state is a fairly competitive society. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, when people talk about this, they don't, I've, I've seen a lot of scientific writing lately talking about the cooperation and the evolution of cooperation, but, and they're talking about it mostly as if it's like a new thing, but the first person who came up with this was a hundred years ago, Peter Kropotkin. And he followed that to the political consequences. I mean, he was a Russian prince. He was an evolutionary biologist, a geographer. And he went out to Siberia being a, a huge fan of Darwin <coughs> to study you know, the biological life in the tundra. And he found that um, animals and insects and all life would cooperate in a very altruistic manner without any centralized form of government. And he observed the same thing in the human societies in Siberia. And he recalled you know, the anarchist writings that he took to when he was younger. And he realized that the political consequences of this was were that the best way to organize society and the most natural would be an anarchist communist way of organizing. And we see that the most long lasting human societies are those that organize themselves in such a manner. I mean, whenever we see really competitive in a hierarchical manner societies, they tend to become you know, empires and then crumble. And I feel like many of the traits that we're showing in this society right now, in the American society we live in, are very sometimes antisocial and sometimes lead to a lot of chaos. And so, so we could do with being more cooperative. What? We, it would be to our advantage to be more cooperative, yeah, in your opinion. Exactly. So, I mean, sometimes people talk about how, well, in a group, people, somebody takes the lead and all of that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's our nature to be that way. It's just that we're cultured to be that way here, but that doesn't mean that it's better because it tends to lead to chaos and it leads to some people being less informed than others. And you, so you brought up the really important question, what is culture? What role does culture play yeah. in human cooperation? I think it's a very complicated issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. a few Can you years ago, hand, I, I'm sorry, my name is Aura, and I was involved in a group assignment. And um, I think the dynamics of that group dealt a lot with culture because there were um, one or two of the men were very um, from a male dominated culture where if the women said anything, it didn't matter what the women said, they just completely ignored what we said like it had no value and we had no opinion so we're <laughs> sitting there trying to do an activity and the women in the group are commenting and the leader is saying well what we have to say doesn't matter and he's and it got to the point where the only way we could get through to him is we would have to go through the guys and we would have to get them away from him to say this is what we think and as long as it came from a guy, he was willing to listen to it. But if it came from a female, he just completely did not listen but to it. But it seems like you developed a cooperative strategy to deal with the problem very effectively. So I, think I, so I think that is a good example of cooperation. By working together, you achieved an equitable outcome, which didn't look like it would have been possible at the onset. Would that be correct? Well, yeah, we just, it just, it was just a hard way to deal with that person. Because, you know, on a good day, it was like the guys sitting watching football, not listening to us. And, you know, if we could pull them away from that, they could listen to us for like two minutes to what we had to say. And that was it. It was, it was a nightmare. 
So when we talk about cooperation in a classroom setting, we're looking at it at a very small scale, and we've also been looking at it on a larger scale. Um, but how do you see cooperation right now, for example, in the city of Miami? Do you think as a city we cooperate well together? No. Any ideas why we don't cooperate well together? <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, for the most part, uh, fundamentally, fundamentally, fundamentally speaking, humans, we cooperate because we're all sitting in a classroom right now and we haven't told one another because we have learned to, through, like, through the development of civilization, we've learned to cooperate with one another for the success of, or for, for the uh, success of our species. But in terms of, uh, let's say, going back to your question of Miami, I mean, when it comes to driving, it seems that <laughs> <laughs> the laws apply to some and not others. Um, for the most part, it is cooperative in that we haven't all crashed on our way here, but, you know, it seems that there are definitely some people that, uh, how would I say, kind of uh, stray away from that. And I think it shows the uh, the aspect of individualism in cultures, you know, and in this case, Miami culture. So. Did, did anybody notice something in David Brooks's um, article, um, Nice Guys Finish First, which suggests that we may be strongly predisposed to be cooperative? There was um, a mention of a study, um, I think it's, it was involving some neuroscientists. Can anybody, anybody find that study and explain what the neuroscientists found? Uh-huh. Um, they found that when you're helping somebody, that made you feel good. And it showed um, you have like the same reaction where it ple of pleasing yourself. So in humans, and I don't believe this has been shown in any other species, but in humans it appears that actually helping or being altruistic is rewarding in itself. So that you don't necessarily have to be helping a relative or an expectation of something in return. I mean, if you always think about people that jump into canals to save people, um, if their car has gone into a canal, um, I don't think that they're expecting anything in return. Something drives us to be extremely altruistic and allows us to be cooperative as a result. But it is very interesting that neuroimaging has shown that the, when we do an altruistic act or help somebody, the pleasure centers in our brain light up. Uh -huh. It makes me think about the fact that in different contexts, amongst different, there are different um, things going on. So for instance, like the dynamic of, of an individual performing an altruistic act towards another individual who you don't know. And it stimulates a pleasure center of the brain, okay? But then there's cooperation on, in a small group, maybe within um, a common, within a classroom in which we're, we're all supposed to cooperate with the common goal or something you want to achieve in mind. But then there's a larger society where there's both kinds of relationships, the people that you know and the people that you don't know. And it seems like in those kinds of relationships, common enemies seem to be a really good motivator for yeah, cooperation. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I was even uh, noting that in that first video, it was fully militarized, like the entire metaphor. They even said, called them the band of brothers. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think it's a scary, I think it's yeah, a scary the video. Imagery, yeah, imagery, everything. Yeah. It was interesting how in the military, you know, cooperation is everything because there's a common enemy. And your, but your life depends on the support as right. well. Right, and there's a common thing that we're all trying to avoid. Yeah. So perhaps we, we need, to think, we need to think about cooperation in terms of like the different types of relationships, like the relational. Well, you know, cooperation must have evolved originally in small groups yeah, like yeah. the headset. And we don't live in those small groups no. anymore. I mean, we don't really recreate anything comparable when we're doing study groups. Those groups are gone. I think it's um, the evolutionary psychologist, um, 
uh, who said that the maximum number of people that we can have close personal relationships with is about 152, 150. And in fact, that's supposed to be your optimal number of Facebook friends as well, if anyone's interested. Once it goes beyond 150, you really have a hard time keeping track. I think that comes from Krasakis' the social networking research, or maybe there's in several different areas. It's Robin Dunbar that came up with the number. It's Dunbar's yeah. number. That's, that's what it's called. Gotcha. But we, you know, we don't live in, in groups of 150 individuals anymore. I mean, we live in a nuclear family and then within a much larger society. So how does cooperation work in our current Beyond context? That. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I think something that makes Miami be such an uncooperative city besides being pretty large is that it's, I think, the city in the country with the biggest gap between the rich and the poor with the biggest social inequities. So I feel like this divisiveness leads to a lot of uncooperation, but at the same time with the driving thing, yeah, a lot of people don't follow the laws of when it comes to driving in Miami, but I've heard a lot, I don't drive, so I don't know personally, but other people, I hear them all the time complaining about tourists because they go like, oh, that, that's a tourist, he doesn't know how to drive in Miami, but he's following the law, yeah, but he doesn't know how to drive in Miami. We've developed a Miami way to drive, and to drive in Miami, even if it's not what the government says you have to drive like according to the law, it's the way we drive, and we created this pattern of how we drive, and then everybody else who lives in Miami just follows that pattern and then order. I, yeah, I think that there are studies with children <laughs> that show that they are very keen to adopt the social norm, or what they perceive as the social norm, and do things in a certain way. Um, ch studies with chimpanzees um, showed that when they were compared to two-year-old kids, if they had, um, I think there may be a slide of this. Yeah, there's a study by uh, Tomasello, and it showed that um, in children, collaboration encourages equal sharing. Um, and in children, the reward they had was toys. So if they collaborated together to obtain some toys, they were much, much, much more likely to share if the distribution was not equitable. And when they repeated the similar experiment with chimpanzees, and this is just a schematic of the testing they did, uh, with the chimpanzees, and they used food as the reward, not toys, um, the chimpanzees did not show a similar um, in, uh, 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 sharing at all um, if they had collaborated. The alternative was that they didn't have to work together to get the reward and children showed far more sharing when they did work together to get the toys than um, if they had just um, got the windfall of toys. Whereas chimpanzees, if they got the windfall of food or if they collaborated together to get the food, they didn't show any increase um, in sharing. And that's at two years old. So clearly it develops very, very early in humans. So, you know, we talked about cooperation in general and then the two um, book reviews that follow, okay, um, it's on the, the book reviews are of this book, The Neighborhood Project, and it's by an evolutionary biologist called David Sloan Wilson. And um, he is a university professor in a town of Binghamton, which is in upstate New York, and it has a population of about 50,000 people. Um, it's... Um, was a thriving town because it was home to a shoe factory and also IBM. IBM originated there. And both those companies really took care of the people in the town very, very well. But those companies are no longer there. So the town is struggling. And at some point he had an epiphany. <laughs> and instead of studying animals, he felt that he wanted to use his background as an evolutionary biologist to try and improve um, the town of Binghamton. And he approached it as a biologist would. He approached the environment and described the environment as a biologist would. And he also um, 
conducted a couple of studies which have been published, which have shown positive results. For any of you that have read the reviews, um, can anybody describe how he quantified the town? Uh huh. I'm just amused that he looked at the amount of decorations people put out on Halloween yeah. to lighting at night or the holidays. And uh, yeah, at Christmas. He decided to do both of those because he thought he would capture both religious and non religious people. Um, I thought that that was a stroke of genius as well. So what he was looking for, he was looking for civic engagement. And he used the pride that people showed in their neighborhood by decorating their homes um, as an indicator of that. And then he matched that to the level of um, pro-sociality, um, the kind of helping co um, altruistic behaviors that were measured in children using a specific test called a DAP test, and he found that there were high correlations between um, neighborhoods in which there was high civic engagement and the children showed strong pro-social behavior in that they were inclined to be pro-social and also be the recipients of pro-sociality as well. He also, he also did a very um, interesting um, experiment, which was called the lost envelope experiment. And what they did was that there were envelopes were dropped in different neighborhoods with a return address on them, uh, with a stamp on them. And it was obvious, or it appeared obvious that somebody had dropped it on the way to the mailbox. And then they, so they waited at the university to see the, the return address was to his address at the university to see which neighborhoods returned the most envelopes. And they found that those neighborhoods where the children were measured as being pro-social and receiving a lot of pro-social behaviors, those were the neighborhoods in which the letters were returned most frequently. So he was able to correlate um, civic engagement with these children that were growing up in those neighborhoods. I mean, I think those, that's the kind of study that I could only imagine an evolutionary biologist designing. Um, but his goal is to improve the town of Bingington, his town, and improve it one block at a time. How do you guys feel about the um, possibility of using um, evolutionary principles to improve a town like Bigington, or even a town <coughs> like Miami. Anyone have any thoughts? I heard on the radio this morning that uh, the UN has designated Miami as the immigration capital of the world. It's the city that is of the world, not just <laughs> of Miami, but there are a higher proportion of folks who were born in another place that live here in Miami than any other city in the world, any other large city. And I have to wonder what implications that have, has for what you're talking about. Because you're talking about you know pro-social behaviors that begin when you're two years old mm -hmm. and in the family, mm -hmm. which are themselves enculturated as you know as the said over here. And so and then yeah, of course that has to do implications with driving too, right? Everybody has a home. So so I wonder, like, we have a unique challenge here in Miami to retrofit these pro-social <laughs> on every block where people are so diverse. Like, would it be easier to do it on blocks where people are less diverse, or? I, don't know. I think someone may have the answer. <laughs> well, I, in my opinion, I think that it'd be, uh, it's possible to do on a micro level, right, with like a smaller social system, like a neighborhood, or, you know, like maybe perhaps like a school or a community of students, you know. But it'd be a lot harder to do once the picture gets bigger, like in a city like Miami, because then a lot of different variables go into it, such as like stereotype attitudes, uh, you know, like any issues that might dwell on uh, social perception, and then also just uh, any, any sort of uh, themes that come from culture, such as uh, like here in the United States, we have a sort of individualist uh, society, and the theme of self-interest comes up a lot. So I think it'd be a little difficult to do something 
in that kind of degree, but I don't think it's impossible. I mean, if he talks about improving his city, the one that he's interested in, one block at a time. And I think that, in fact, Miami is a whole, um, a whole assemblage of small neighborhoods. I mean, that's, that's my feeling. I mean, you just get it when you drive through Miami. You can be in Little Havana, and you can be in downtown within five minutes. And they're completely different worlds. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think about empathy and our ability to, to empathize with others and how that contributes to cooperation. And something about neighborhoods, and especially in suburbia, where well, we don't know our neighbors and we don't see our neighbors. And so maybe one, one thing that could be done is um, maybe with regards to city planning, making it so that people see each other and are forced to interact. So Bianca, I know who you are, but I didn't ask you for your name. Bianca. It's Bianca. <laughs> no, I think that's really inter interesting. And I think about it just here on campus. Um, when I, I now have an office in the biology department, and when I walk down the corridor, uh, my office is at the end, you know, the little cubicles, and the doors are usually shut. We have somebody whose door is nearly always open, <laughs> which is wonderful because um, I'm able to say hello. Uh, but we seem to kind of not um, open ourselves up enough. And when I come on campus too, and I see how much building is going on, you know, the car parks are going on, that, that are rising everywhere. And we do have a possibility of parking off campus and taking a bus to come in campus come to campus, could we make it more attractive for us to be altruistic and do that? I think that those kind of issues haven't been you know, discussed enough, or maybe I, I, I don't know, but it seems that we could be building a better campus if we thought about what kind of environment we would really like to live in. Um, I don't spend much of my time here at this campus. I spend most of it down in the Redland, where it's wooded and beautiful. And you know, I think I'm escaping the concrete jungle when I drive south. Um, and I think that the campus here is just getting built up all the time. And we're not trying to open it up so that we can enjoy beauty and we can make connections between people. And I think that's what you're talking about, Bianca. That it's difficult to do. But I think that if maybe biologists or people that are trained in kind of how animals interact socially were involved in planning processes, we might end up with something that was very, very different. Anybody, any biologists here that have a thought on that? <laughs> Andrew, what do you think? <laughs> um, I think a lot of um, these papers and books have a view on cooperation and competitiveness as a dichotomous relationship, but really it isn't. And the effectiveness, I think, of the I think that the neighborhood project is that it uses the interaction between the two to foster more cooperation. So it's by getting groups to cooperate with each other to compete between groups in a more friendly manner and getting people to interact more often that it gets them to cooperate more. How were they competing? It's a design part and yeah. stuff like that. That was one of the projects that Sloan Wilson had. He tried to encourage groups in the community to have a competition to design the best car. Do you know what? Never went anywhere. You couldn't get enough people to cooperate to compete, in effect. So that was, a, you know, and, and I think that in reality, he's not going to be able to succeed in the way in Binghamton as he would, you know, have liked. I think it is very challenging to mobilize people, but I think people need to be rewarded in some way. Cooperation is such a massive scale, especially as a mentality within a person. It's, it's fragile, it's something that has to be developed over a lifetime. And a lot of studies have looked at um, how uh, environmental enrichment um, like is psychologically good for an organism, especially with rats. And you know, they've shown that um, persons like rats that are stimulated at a very young age by their mothers uh, tend to be a lot more psychologically stable later on in life. So really, the, the big target is our children, or at least the other people in our generation. Because if you get them to interact with people more often, and you get them out there in the world, you're more likely to have a more progress society, rather than working from the top down. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that that's the thing. <coughs> from there, like, that becomes the world. Whereas 
One of the um, successes he has had with the neighborhood project was in a school. It was a failing school where kids were failing at least three classes. And by creating, and he did it using eight steps, which are laid out in a publication of his, he created a more pro-social um, learning environment. And it was successful. He found it with a control group, another school, where kids had failed three classes as well. They Far, far more of these students graduated from high school and scored higher on standardized tests. And in fact, they were actually comparable to um, students from Binghamton overall. And so that was on a very small scale. But maybe it's these small scale pro projects that are needed to grow a, you know, a more cooperative society. I think a lot of these things are very systemic issues, but at the same time, a lot of what people are talking about touches on the concept of prefigurative politics. Like Which is what? Like building the new world in the shell of the old. If we want a society that is less hierarchical, more cooperative, more egalitarian, even though the issues right now are systemic and they come from the top to the bottom, from the bottom we can build it up and working on things like direct action, when we have a problem, try to bring our community together, and the same people who are affected by that problem be the ones who take the initiative and bring about change in their communities by cooperating. And I feel like that happens a lot already organically in Miami, in certain communities, because we do live in a city that's full of ethnic and complex. <coughs> and something that's really interesting is that, for example, when I live in Doral, and my boyfriend lives in Sweetwater. Doral is a middle class and sometimes upper class neighborhood, and Sweetwater is the lower class neighborhood, say. And something that he observes a lot is that everybody in Sweetwater is very sociable, everybody cooperates. When somebody needs to paint their house, everybody helps their house, and then they paint the next one and the next one, and there's fruit trees everywhere, and people give it out to their friends, and that's a way of socializing, and I know that happens a lot in like Little Haiti and other neighborhoods. I think there was a study recently but um, and in Doral, it's just all the houses are very shut out to each other, and nobody talks to each other. You never see anybody on the street. Nobody cooperates, you know, because they feel like there's no need for that social solidarity. Everybody just goes to work, and they don't. They feel like if they have an issue, they have the money to, you know, solve solve on themselves. And that's what he found exactly the same thing <coughs> in Binghamton. He found that. Um, it wasn't related to income level. N neighborhoods that were high income did not show high pro-social behavior. It was actually the lower income. Not the, um, not the very, very poor neighborhoods uh, where the social fabric seemed to be collapsing, yeah. but in, in medium or lower income neighborhoods, <coughs> there was a much, much higher degree of pro-sociality. So that would match exactly what you're describing for um, for Miami. Uh -huh. I have a question about that. Was, were the, were the um, econ socioeconomic um, factors, did those correlate with the cultural demographics? Like, so for example, were the lower class neighborhoods that people were looking at were mostly uh, uh, non-native non -native to the United States? Let me, let's be like Romney and say lower income. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. He didn't make that point. I mean, I don't think that study is published, so I don't know. But I think your point from, I mean, which which community that you're talking about, Doral or Sweetwater? Doral is Venezuelan mostly, and then <laughs> <laughs> Sweetwater is mostly Nicaraguan, so both are made up of immigrants. Yeah. But you know, the Venezuelans who move to Raleigh are like more middle upper class Venezuelans. They're up there, they, they have a higher income level. Yeah. So it seems that income level seems to be as important, maybe, as culture of origin. Yeah, there are 
certain path. After, I guess, I worked for a time in um, at Gulliver. Uh -huh. We had a very diverse. Does thing. everybody know what Gulliver is? It was is? a private uh, school. Families pay twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars for their first, second grader, third grader <laughs> to go for a year to go to school. And um, and a very diverse student body because there were a lot of families that would come um, from other countries to work in large corporations on you know Brickell Avenue. So folks from all over the world, and yet there was everybody dressed like the same, everybody aspired to the same clothes, the same type of home, the same neighborhood, the same car, kind of car. They were sort of symbols of achievement that seemed like a universal language, like Esperanto or something like that. <laughs> and it really kind of brought people together in an interesting way. Um, I thought I felt a lot of community there, but I wasn't sh I wasn't sure exactly what I was experiencing to tell you the truth. Because I wasn't sure if it was cooperation for the kids or if it was something that was show or if it was yeah. like we've all we all have this common language but when we go back to our homes it's something different. It was um, it was a very unique experience for me because I was never I never I, and I didn't fit in because I wasn't part of that socioeconomic level. Um, there's a lot of free time amongst parents that didn't exist um, in other communities. Um, and I wasn't sure if it was actually competitive, you know, that like, who can be the most uh, generous with the class parties and things like that. But there was some kind of a commonality <laughs> at that socioeconomic level that cut across culture. That, that's very interesting because he looks at churches in Jamaica <coughs> as well for the sense of community and cooperation that you find within churches. Um, and so maybe it's somewhat comparable right, to, to, the the, school, to the school, school situation. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's like a universal middle class, sort of upper middle class and upper class culture, I guess. I mean, you see, I, I, this is reminding me of the book Young and the Fine in Tehran. There's um, the upper level of people in Tehran who live in this neighborhood called Barat and Barla, which they just pronounced. They all had a common culture, and it was very similar to the culture that middle class people have in other countries, and in the US especially. So they were all bound together against the rest of the city because of this common westernized culture. If they moved to the US, they would fit in better than somebody who came from the lower class culture in Tehran. So maybe this inequitable society that we have at the moment in the US with very, very wealthy people, and people that are suffering very badly. It's very difficult to create a cooperative society under these circumstances. And we need something more equitable. And I think we all have the opportunity to make a decision about what kind of society we want to live in uh, very soon. Uh -huh. neighborhoods, for example, children are probably not playing outside on the street because they have a lot of opportunities to have ballet class classes, dancing classes. And so that's a similar sort of issue, but with much younger children. Because in FSU at Tallahassee, it's a very small town. Yeah. And so maybe cooperation works best where there isn't a movie theater or clubs right. or my South Beach. <laughs> I don't think we're going to eliminate that in Miami very easily, though. Are there any other thoughts? Any questions? Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for coming and sharing your ideas. And thank you, Dr. Evans.